Dear colleagues, uh, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Georg uh, Menkian to moderate this panel. He is one of the best uh, scholars in the field of soul focuses uh, research in Armenia. So, Dr. Georg Menkian, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we need to honor to moderate this interesting panel and to be present at this very important conference on China and its relation with uh, different regions uh, like China and South Caucasus and Central Asia. I just wish a fruitful conference and discussion to all our panelists. Uh, first, let me to introduce myself. My name is Georg Medikan. I am the assistant to the president of the Republic of Armenia. And I also have the privilege and honor to teach at this wonderful university. Tonight, I will be moderating this very interesting panel discussion with distinguished speakers from China, India, Georgia, Russia, and Armenia. The panel is dedicated to relations between China and Central Asia, and South Caucasus analyzed from different perspectives. China's various interactions with those two regions have a multi layer character, even geopolitical, domestic, political, social, economic, commercial, cultural, and other aspects. With which have a large impact on the dynamics of the multidimensional cooperation. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 allowed China to revise and largely shift its foreign policy and economic approach and to start taking steps towards recalibration with local and global priorities and goals in security, trade, energy, investment, and other sectors in a way that those projects are not dependent on Russia or the United States. Gradually, China started to position itself both as a global and regional player by implementing new investment strategies designed for different regions and increasing its political and economic influence worldwide. China has already set up a series of new effective tools, such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Belt and Road Initiative, among others, which allow China to boost its relations to different projects and initiatives with various regional players, including countries of South Caucasus and Central Asia. Whether China will be successful in those regions depends on various factors. The world is rapidly changing, and it's a challenge for all nations, including China, to adjust their strategies and face new realities. We need to explore those different factors and global transformations to help us understand the extent to which China and the countries of Central Asia and South Caucasus are well positioned to adapt themselves to those changes and produce long-term outcomes, including through cooperation, bilateral and multilateral partnerships. The fact that Central Asian and South Asian countries have different foreign and economic policies, have security concerns, and face various domestic issues, including those imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic, makes it even more challenging for China to implement effective strategies. Tonight, our distinguished speakers will have an opportunity to provide their insights and thoughts across the spectrum of those multi layer relations between China and the regions of the South Caucasus and Central Asia, and also answer some questions. Now, let me open the floor to our speakers. And just to remind that every speaker will have only 10 minutes to present his or her paper or article or share his or her views and insights with our audience. Please respect the time limit. To allow to take questions also at the end of presentations. Our first speaker is Marina Dimitriva from Far Eastern Federal University, Vladimir Vaskochny Federal University in Vladivostok, Russia. She is a senior lecturer at the Department of International Relations of the Institute of Oriental Studies at the School of Regional and International Studies. She will present to her article titled Prospects for Multilateral Cooperation in Central Asia. Please, Dr. Dimitriou, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, dear organizers and participants. Greeting from far east of Russia. It's a great honor for me and my colleague to participate in such a event. Unfortunately, he has no opportunity to join me today. It's my solo. Uh, and I know that we have a lot of reports ahead of my, so I'll try to briefly 
outline our idea. So uh, even though state remains the main participant in international process, the development of multilateral regional cooperation plays an important role in the dynamics of global political, economical and social process. Threatening over the ties between states has positive impact on regions' position in the system of international relations. And one of the topical issues for each of the Central Asia states uh, is uh, threatening position in the dialogue with non-regional partners. However, uh, the Central Asian republics cannot act as an equal partner with non-regional actors. And that is why they are forced to become depend on more influential players, becoming field of the implementation of other countries' foreign policy initiative. Uh, in this regard, one of the priority tasks facing the leaders of the states of the region is to create a platform a, to build a integrational multilateral structure without a particip participation of uh, states and international institutions that are not directly related to Central Asia. Experts, politicians and activists began to declare the thesis about the need for reintegration of Central Asia or integration under new condition immediately after the Soviet Union collapsed. And, you know, numerous conferences, articles and analytical reports covering this issue and predicting the prosperity of the regional multiplied every year, but did not have much influence on the real course of events, unfortunately. And uh, the government of the states of the region agreeing with the arguments about the benefits of coexistence were not ready to delegate part of sovereignty to any supranational structures. As a result, some uh, international institutions like Central Asia Economic Community or Organization of Central Asia Cooperation did not receive proper development. And in the future, the states of the region began to join various unions that were initiated by, by non-regional actors who offer their regional projects to, to Central Asia states, but it's only distant them from their own initiatives. And um, young states of Central Asia had to maneuver between non-regional players who were trying to settle in this region. And as a result, all states of the region began to declare a multi-vector foreign policy. And the leaders of the Central Asia countries are playing on the contradictions between great powers to extract maximum benefits uh, in form of loans, investments, weapons, and rent payment for military bases on their territory. Uh, the tax tactics chosen by the Central Asia republics to pursue a multi-vector foreign policy course is understandable, um, but it's an obstacle to, to the establishment of extra regional ties. And the activity of new leadership of Uzbekistan and proclamation of regional cooperation by Tashkent and Nur Sultan as a priority direction of foreign policy have become like a signal of a possible change. And the meeting of the heads of states without any mediation of non-regional players caused even more optimism. And the first informal summit were held in Kazakhstan in 2018, and the second one next year, 2019, uh, were held in uh, Tashkent. And um, 
the heads of states discussed the problems of regional, the solutions, the transport sector, trade, education, tourism, and so on. And Frederick Starr said that a structure like ASEAN may soon appear in Central Asia. And in his opinion, after years of playing against each other, the Central Asia states have joined the effort and achieve common well-being. And the expectation of Russia experts were also very high. But unfortunately, this expectation were not met. And outbreak of coronavirus pandemic did not the first cause, the first reason for this situation. The states still have a distrust of supranational structures and bilateral relations are still overshadowed by border conflicts and water energy contradictions. Um, this year on August, there was a third uh, meeting of the heads of Central Asia states. Um, no breakthrough fateful decision were made during the summit and it was difficult to expect it. Uh, the pandemic slowed the even lower level of integrational cooperation and party just checked their watch, evaluate the results, achieve and set some new goals. And summing up, we can say that the foreign policy task of the Central Asia states have some uh, common features, but in general, the individual strategies and goals are very uh, different, more and more. So in fact, today it's difficult to talk about the unity of Central Asia. And from our point of view, uh, maybe perhaps it's time to move away from talking about integration. After all, institutions are not a panacea that can help to solve all serious problems of regional uh, ec economy and politician uh, changes, challenges. And uh, Central Asia states should begin to cooperate closely and effectively on certain, certain issues. This cooperation does not necessarily have a formalized form or, of any union or something like block. Uh, such a format for solving many common problems will rather unite the regional than supranational structure. And in fact, no one else in the regional is interested in the joint uh, interaction because non-regional actors pursue exclusively their own goals and objectives. So uh, that's it all. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. You have still one minute. You can use it if you have something to have, uh, like a conclusion or whatever. Okay. Okay. Let's let's go to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Dmitry. If we have time, you know, I have some questions, and uh, eventually we can discuss those issues regarding Central Asia. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Sutik Singh from India. Dr. Sutik Singh is a teaching professor of political science at DLC College at the University of Delhi. His paper is focused on the Indian perception of China-Central Asia relationship. Dr. Singh, the four years. Thank you very much. Good evening to all of you from Delhi, India. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Meher, Sankyan and team for organizing this uh, so much uh, important uh, webinar, I believe some sort of seminar also, it is hybrid one. Let me jump on Central Asia, India relation and China as a factor. Uh, right from the inception of uh, Central Asia, just after the end of the Cold War, 
India has adopted a policy of engagement with the Eurasian region centered to Central Asia. Central Asia's five republics are bigger combinedly in terms of territory. It has over 4 million square kilometer and it is almost 1 million kilometer square kilometer bigger than entire Indian territory. But population wise, it is a very small area. But it has huge natural resources, particularly oil, gas, and fresh water, hydroelectricity, etc. And India has emerged as fourth global energy consumer. And India is uh, curiously willing to take all those energy sources to diversify its energy basket because of growing economy. You know, due to Corona, economy has slowed down, but it has again picked up. And this financial year, it may go more than 10%. So this is one. Uh, second one is that uh, uh, since uh, last one decade, India has adopted a policy of look west also. And uh, connect Central Asia and Eurasia region since 2010. And 10 years down the line, this policy has gone down well. And we have engagements with uh, Central Asian republics uh, in a massive way uh, by economic uh, one, by academic one, by cultural one, by, because we have a historical and civilizational relationship between Central Asian uh, republics and India and also with the Eurasian regions, because Central Asia we perceive as a gateway of uh, Eurasia and uh, Eurasia has emerged as a new uh, point of uh, interest for India's foreign policy. In October 2021, India's foreign minister, Dr. S. J. Sankar, visited uh, many parts of Central Asia and finally he landed up to Yerevan and it was a modern Indian foreign minister visit to Yerevan since last many years. So. Prime Minister Modi, uh, upon his arrival in power in May 2014, visited all five Central Asian republics in one go uh, in July 2015. That was a modern Indian prime ministerial visit to the whole region of Central Asia within a span of one week. And he inked many deals many connectivity projects have started and many things have also come up. We have a trade relationship roughly five to seven billion dollars with the Central Asian republics. It has huge potentialities, but due to the lack of land route, which has been denied us by Pakistan and turbulence of Afghanistan, we have not been able to connect Central Asian republics uh, by land route. Although we have developed Chawar port in Iran and we have tried to link uh, Chawar port to Central Asian republics and Central Asian republics have viewed Chawar port as one of the alternative route to the warm water and also an alternative route to save themselves from the Chinese pressures. So Afghan scenario has emerged a, a, a new uh, threat. It has come out with a new threat because previous Afghan turbulence between 96 to 2001, Taliban regime one, has taught us a lesson that the entire Central Asia was engulfed with uh, terrorism and drug trafficking was also one of the most emerging phenomena at that point of time. So India hosted a one-day uh, Afghan summit in Delhi in early part of November uh, 2021 and uh, major countries of Central Asian republics have attended that meeting including Russia and uh, other countries. So that has come out with a uh, new uh, policy to provide a kind of solace to the suffering Afghan population and in that series India has uh, uh, sanctioned 5 uh, million tons of wheat to the Afghan people. Afghan turbulence has created a huge uh, possibility of a uh, 
spill over of terrorism and death and destruction from afghanistan to central asian republics because oxus river which is also called as amudarya river demarcate between demarcate central asia to afghanistan and turbulence in afghanistan have been always turbulent for the central asian republics so here it is a synergy between india and uh, central asian republics chinese factor is important because china has expanded its uh, uh, trade with the region and it has over 40 billion dollar trade and uh, its bri project uh, also connects many important cities of central asia russia is an important player because russia uh, remains dominant in the area because it is a old soviet union area and uh, russia perceive it as their own territory in terms of the arc of their strategic influence therefore russia always wishes that this area must be diversified by many powers and balance of power russia always seek and india provide that balance of power in the region which are with china is concerned because of its exclusive debt policy which is detrimental to the smaller economies like central asian republics take the example of sri lanka and many other african countries whose economies has crumbled due to the sustainable chinese debt traps so central asian republic also the republics also understood this problem and we have a deepening relationship with the region and uh, we have a uh, uh, military air base in near to afghan border in tajikistan and that is uh, in operation since 2000 and it is 2020 21 year old uh, uh, air strip and we are operating it with uh, all support to our central asian brothers uh, central asian leaders have also visited uh, frequently in, in new delhi president putin is coming to new delhi on 6th of december and one of the point of his uh, incoming visit will be central asian republics because as i have stated that uh, uh, russia wishes that central asia should be diversified by multiplicity of power and uh, india provides that uh, particular situation strategic situation to the central asian republics but uh, we have to accept the reality that economic li and uh, connectivity point of view we are not so much connected with the central asian republics as china is connected even russia is uh, trailing there so we need to accelerate our connectivity efforts with the central asian republics be it air connectivity or be it uh, land connectivity corona prevalence has also prevented the process but uh, right now we are connecting uh, more than five cities of the central asian republics and i am concluding sir and uh, i understand that by next uh, few years we will have a very good relationship in terms of connectivity in terms of multiple cooperation with the central asian republics and india is going to play a proactive role in central asian republics and a, as a counterbalance to china thank you very much thank you very much and let's uh, go to our next speaker our next speaker is dr sun chao who is an associate professor at the center for international studies at jiangsu administration institute at the young researcher at the center for russian studies at the east china normal university his paper is titled semi presidentialism and political stability a reflection on political transition in the caucasus Dr. Chao, please take the floor. Thank you very much. It's my very honor uh, to be here to uh, participate in this uh, great uh, conference. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Medic Kyang, uh, in some production. Uh, my topic now here is a semi-presidentialism and political stability, a reflection on the political transition in the Caucasus. Um, As you know, my research agenda is is uh, is divided in four parts. Uh, first, we talk about the path of the regime change. Next, we talk talk about the semi-presidential system, and then uh, regime revolution uh, give the the conclusion. Uh, 
my 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 research uh, my research is is come from the understanding the new uh, the fourth wave of democratization. As we know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the political transition in New Asia should have transition to the new direction. The the come come out the result is that the settling of value uncertainty is the direction. And uh, we can get a conclusion that if the national elites identify with the older system prevail, the countries tend to be authoritarian, and vice versa democratizes. So, uh, so uh, we come from uh, one puzzle about the regime change in Eurasia. There are two types of explanations. One thing of the regime change in Eurasia equals color revolution. The regime would and will be changed by the Western through the social movements and uh, protest, which are part of a democratic strategy in Eurasia. China and Russia's many scholars uh, uh, think is 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 normal and uh, is uh, normal to understand the Americans' uh, strategy in Eurasia. But uh, there are another uh, understanding of the regime change in Eurasia is just the governance values. The Western scholars, uh, most of them uh, think that when the government couldn't meet the demands, uh, is especially in nationalism, national owner, uh, economic equality, or political participants of the people, the regime change would happen easily. But the two types of explanations have these is shortcomings. All the two theories were the shock to response theory. The question is the real dynamical mechanism of the regime change. So uh, we, we can kind of, uh, from this uh, architectural literature, we can see the problems of the paradigms of the transition from the external uh, environment, starting conditions, the mechanism of political transition, the strategy, uh, strategy of political transition and the effects of transition. We can see the many uh, nations, and especially Russia, South Caucasus, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan and Central Asia has its uh, own uh, developing uh, road and is not uh, according to the, the Western democratic transition. So we can see there's another uh, paradigm to understand uh, the change of the regime in the Eurasia. Now we can see the new understanding uh, view, the semi paradigm uh, in the third world. Now we know that uh, in the early 1990s, uh, the American scholars gave up uh, the same paradigm into two subsects. One is the presidential parliamentary system. The prime minister is nominated by the president and approved by parliament. The other is the primary presidential system. The prime minister is nominated by the parliament and then appointed by the president. But the Kibinda Kamazetu uh, have found that in the 22 uh, political units of former a former Soviet Union and Eastern uh, European countries. The rest, uh, most of them uh, choose a semi presidential system. So we can see the semi presidentialism prevail in the Eurasia. We can give some uh, reason to explain it. Uh, first is similarity between the semi presidentialism and the dual power structure between the party and the government inherited from the Soviet Communist Party. The second is that even if the Khan contingent grants parliament the power to appoint the prime minister, the president will have the ample opportunity to intervene the selection of the prime minister. The third is the elected presidency more democratic and response to voter design to influence the national politics. So we can give the characters, characteristic of the same presidency advantage is suitable for any official political institution good population, a fatalistic form, and then the check balance is easily realized. A disadvantage is unstable, no hard to keep the political institution closed, and a big test for the political leader to constrain the situation. So we can give the regime revolution in Eurasia. We can use the formal uh, theory uh, to give it the real revolution through the three stages. The first stage is, is the nationalistic power. And then the second stage is, is from the nationalistic power to semi presidentialism Then the third stage uh, is have two directions. One direction to patriotism, 
optimization to a parameter system. Uh, second direction is the presidential designization. So the great personal president. So we can see it's, it's uh, come from, and now I use the uh, South Caucasus uh, regime, I change it, uh, the evolution to explain it. We can see it's, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the ethnic war spawns the wing tax for all politics, especially in the South Caucasus. And we know that I many of Georgia both experienced the bottom revolutions. But Azerbaijan's political process was the result of strong Turkish interference. So the two famous uh, leaders, Gamsa Khwajian and Tara Prorina, also the former communist leadership, formed the new groups of political Azerbaijan, on the other hand, fell into political terminal in the short. So the, the first uh, regime, uh, Revolution One, we can, we can see the regime uh, evolution from nationalistic to government to the political system, especially uh, the Georgia and 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 and, and uh, Azerbaijan, uh, they they face the different 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 situations, especially in the South Ossetia as as Bahasia. As she well done as well, the point that the president to tackle with the crisis, but the forms cannot uh, swallow it. And at the same time, many Azerbaijans can face the same uh, problems. Uh, Nagaro Karabakh war uh, in two, 1919 to 1994, uh, it's, 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 it's changed the, the regimes, uh, regime, the forms of re regime, and, uh, and, uh, and it gives a new uh, position for the political heroes such as Gader Aliyev and Robert uh, Kachayang. So we can see the revolutionary tools is, is very beneficial for the president to expand their powers. So we can use the one expect to explain the petrol, a uh, petrol system, presidential system. The petrol uh, it refers to the use of political power, many through the selective transfer of the resource to those who follow both rather than institutions. Such a system is the pronocytical cycle of the Edwin revolutionary and elite alliance as a political elite expansion for the future change. So we can see in the, in the two revolution and uh, revolution two, we can we can see regime revolution as in a change of direction. Uh, Armenia president Robert Kachian uh, with a very uh, 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 strong and no single power. And uh, the opposite is the uh, Edward Ivan Donat. And uh, Aliyev is a very vigorous development of petrol uh, enemy. So we can see uh, the three nations comes a, a different direction. So that comes to this uh, evolution three. Someone from a deck, uh, like a lemon duck presidential system to parliamentary presidential uh, system uh, is passionate for the Georgia. Uh, I, I don't uh, have no uh, rich time to, to explain it. Uh, the, the second one is from the lambda presidential system to the parliamentary uh, system, especially is is uh, the the cases Armenia. That we can see that uh, from the political history of Armenia, we can see that Armenia, Armenia, the, the president of Armenia sometimes uh, can control the situation. Sometimes it, it cannot uh, solve solve the national uh, demand of the people. Especially for the Nagaro Karabakh question. The regional revenue three is uh, Azerbaijan from the semi presidential system to super uh, presidential system, especially for Adia Aliyev. Aliyev, especially in the, uh, the uh, last year, is, is used some, uh, some, some, so use the other, other powers, especially Turkey and the France, to help them to. Got some advantage over Armenia, so it's uh, uh, get more legitimacy. So we can give. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, just one minute. So we can see the reason for the different trends of the three nations. From this one, we can give the, our um, logical regime revolution the South Caucasus. It is create a regime that makes them serve their needs. Most of their institutions reflect the purpose of elites. But the level of uh, presidential governance determine whether the semi president continues or no other way of France. Thank you. Uh, my uh, presentation in the here. <laughs> Dr. Chow, thank you very much. Indeed, it was a very interesting presentation full of insights about the connection between the regime 
in the post-Soviet countries and the political stability. So if we have time, I mean, it's a very interesting topic for all, for all those who are interested in uh, studying post-Soviet space and uh, uh, the establishment of institutions and political regime. So thank you again. And let's go to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Salome Danelia. She is from Georgia. She is the head of subsidy and production department at the Ministry of Education, Science, Culture, and Sport of Georgia, and an invited lecturer at Ivan Ed Javakishvili at Tbilisi State University. Her main areas of academic interest are international <laughs> economic principles, international economic relations. Financially, we are focusing on peculiarities of innovative development of economy in Georgia. Dr. Danelia. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, uh, my pre presentation is dedicated to the peculiarity of innovation development uh, of economy in Georgia. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I want to mention that under the global economic, um, uh, so classical economic doctrines cannot reflect every aspect of the country economic uh, competitiveness as non-traditional factor of economic de development play an equally important role um, in achieving the country economic goals. Uh, in the view of the mentioned um, knowledge and innovation are essential factor of economic development of the present stage. Consequently, at the present stage in the process of a uh, global competitiveness, the study of innovation, economic, uh, the factor of um, self-establishment is also relevant for the country with the limited nature resources. Um, so uh, I want to mention that the innovation is an important factor of economic growth, uh, which affects the structure of production, um, the social situation of the economic and ensuring the stabilization of socioeconomic uh, situation in the country. Um, so innovation policy of a country defined by the state. The innovation development strategy should be in line um, with the country uh, socioeconomic development strategy and program. Uh, it should be noted that they're creating a legal framework for, for the formation of innovation uh, economics in Georgia began in the 19th or the last uh, century. So I, I want to uh, talk about the one international index um, such as global innovation index and compare with the um, uh, situation with the uh, Eastern Partnership country and uh, EU member post-Soviet country. The features show that from the above mentioned um, uh, comparison of Georgia with the Eastern Partnership country and uh, as I mentioned with the post-Soviet uh, member country, uh, the feature uh, show the uh, uh, the um, EU member states have been promoted. Esto uh, first uh, stage is Estonia and following by the Lithuania and Latvia. Uh, and uh, now about the post-Soviet Eastern Partnership country um, uh, scores, the uh, leader is the Ukraine and the last place is occupied by the uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, the Global Innovation in Index in the post-Soviet country in terms of rating review. This rating are important to analyze the present index according to all seven categories. Among the post-Soviet country, Estonia occupied the uh, leading position and belonged to the group of high-income uh, country. Among the, among the um, post-Soviet country represented in the diagram, Estonia and the leader in the seven category. So now about the um, uh, China's uh, situation. Uh, the China is still um, the only middle-income economy among the, among the uh, world top uh, 13 most innovation countries. It has established itself as a global innovation leader and it's pro um, approaching the um, top 10. Um, China's uh, success story can be explained by its consistent and um, uh, persistent innovation policy planning and, it, um, and execution for more than three decades, as well as by the fact that it has impressively increasing spending on education, science, and technology. 
but uh, more importantly, it is the country's ability to translate pro-innovation policy. With innovation inputs into sound results, such as in, in intellect, intellectual property, innovative uh, product, and high-tech exports. The speed uh, with which China has built um, well-known high-tech firms, mostly in the information and communication technology sector or uh, the white goods sector, including the large home applic application and so forth, which are now around uh, the world has been impressive. Despite the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, Global Innovation Index showed that global uh, uh, has not slowed down the China situation, exceptionally in area where they uh, aim to overcome the pandemic. Top country and top firm have been relatively uh, resilient, and they have, um, have to say that spurred uh, innovation throughout the crisis. Um, uh, so, uh, we consider uh, it uh, important to take into account the following recommendation and uh, proposal of a, uh, for Georgia and Eastern um, Partnership country. Uh, first recommendation is to increasing access to information. It is imp important because uh, for the state to active to um, uh, disseminate information on uh, innovation process in the country and provide information on issues such as a startup funding uh, or uh, financing programs granted information about technology center and so forth also creating digital hubs uh, the uh, epidemic situation um, uh, has in um, uh, so intensify the need for it, for the development of digital technology. Uh, we we believe that the potential for creating digital hub in Georgia uh, is high, which is due to the location of the uh, country. First of all, it was at the New Silk um, uh, New Silk Road Forum that Asian countries are interested in um, uh, an alternative way to access the European internet. This is the best possibility for creating a digital hub in Georgia. As Georgia can, uh, can uh, connect uh, European through the infrastructure border through the digital Silk Road. The road to transfer international internet vo volume can be implementing through two digital corridor, such as from uh, Europe via Georgia toward the Middle East, uh, Middle East, and from Georgia uh, to uh, South Asia. Uh, the uh, third recommendation to uh, cl uh, cluster development. We believe that uh, decentralization is one of the key factors that support regional development, which can be achieved through cluster development. International uh, practice uh, provokes that the cluster exists to develop small and medium sized business. And furthermore, to uh, create a regional innovation system. Uh, the last recommendation is the uh, human capital. Because the human capital plays a crucial role in the process of innovative development, as it, it, it's a cre uh, creator of innovations, right? The accord accordingly, it is necessary to improve the quality of education and create high quality per, um, uh, personnel who will then meet to the growing demand of the market and create opportunity for the development of the knowledge-based economy. It is uh, true that within the framework of, uh, of the association agreement between Georgia and the European Union, Georgia is approaching the European standard of education quality. Also many issues need to be improved uh, and uh, it is uh, necessary for the state to promote uh, fundamental research and stimulate students to participate in this scientific um, activity. So that's all. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And our last but not least speaker is Mariam Papakam from Armenia.
Mariam is from German State University, Department of International Relations as a PhD scholar. She will be presenting her paper titled China and South Texas, New Perspectives on Chinese. Mariam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. I would like to introduce you to the main points of my study, the full version of which you can acquaint with in my article. In the Middle East and in uh, South Caucasus, China is regularly becoming one of the important geopolitical factors with which all countries in the region seek to build new quality relations. In order to get a good idea of the race for influence in the region, uh, in our analysis, we have tried to understand what influence and China's interest and its main competitors. First of all, the United States and Russia have. Uh, Turkey and Iran play a key role in the South Caucasus. So, in the framework of our analysis, we have separately studied China's relation with each of these countries. Finally, we try to understand the impact of China's regional policy on the countries of the South Caucasus, as we presented the vision and prospects for the development of Armenian Chinese relations. One of the important conclusions of the analysis is that the deepening of multidisciplinary relations with the China uh, and uh, Iran axis may become a geopolitical alternative for Armenia, which in case of collapse of the uh, current regional security system will ensure the country from uh, ontological threats. So the People's Republic of China, one of the key geopolitical actors of the 21st century has continuously increased its share of political influence and involvement in the South Caucasus thus always keeping the South Caucasus vector of its foreign policy active. In a rapidly changing world, in the framework of new geopolitical realities and changes, in the context of continued development and consequently over time and by historical necessity, China has often reinterpreted and redefined its political, economic, cultural and other interests and goals in the South Caucasus. First of all, taking into account the attitude of the region states, the policy toward the Chinese side, perceptions, positions on the Chinese initiatives, expectations, as well as the issues of opportunities and possible challenges and threats of bilateral cooperation, which were of paramount importance for the Chinese side in implementing its foreign policy, especially for the selection of the use of appropriate tools. It should be noted that at various times, and especially today, the most important direction of the foreign policy of the region was the activation of Eastern vector, which was the first perceived and today is perceived by the development of uh, multi vector relations and cooperation with the Chinese side to achieve mutually beneficial cooperation, especially taking into account the historical fact that uh, the Chinese side will, will uh, not go beyond the outline framework of cooperation. That is, will not be involved, will not be participating in process of regional conflicts or in their settlements. In this context, it is obvious that the Chinese side's priority is not to get involved in various uh, inter-regional development and changes. No matter how uh, much regional states, especially Georgia and Azerbaijan, are interested in it, but to pursue only one goal, to achieve its own goals and operate according to the developed strategy and strengthen its role and importance with stability and with various technical successes. The South Caucasus region, being a multi ethnic group of different civilizations and cultures, is at the same time the center of many contradictions, unresolved issues, and conflicts. This fact, uh, which is currently at the peak of development and threatening in all components, forces the Chinese side to develop more favorable conditions and opportunities for its own interests, often redefining its policy towards the countries in the region, perceiving the region as a historically its own long-term interest framework, framework with uh, region states. As a key part of its belt and road strategy, the South Caucasus today, in the Chinese sense, it, uh, is in addition to the hub of bilateral relations with Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, an integral part of the chain of continuation of its own strategic steps. So, the South Caucasus part of its very important for uh, the uh, success for its Belt and Road strategy. Thus, the role of the individual state in the South Caucasus uh, region in general, the position of the Chinese side in it, 
and that is the transformation from an influential actor to the key actor uh, to ensure the realization of its own political and economic interests and goals are still facing various issues, highlighting various opportunities, perspectives, and challenges, which in turn give and predetermine the outline, which all include the summary of the regional policy of the Chinese side, all its components, and will give its general picture. In other words, uh, international discussions and perceptions of geopolitics, the topic of the South Caucasus as a rule, arises in a broader context as one of the components of the security of the Greater Middle East region, thus presenting the general picture of this uh, Chinese foreign policy. In the first case, the focus is usually on the dangers of um, Russia-West conflict, the parallels between the Ukraine and Caucasus conflicts. And in the second case, the relations of the South Caucasus with Iran, the role of the region in the settlement of Syrian conflict. Given the fact, uh, we can give the main conclusions that emerge from the study of Chinese foreign policy on all region in several tenses. Thus, in the uh, current situ uh, situation, the growing influence of the regional actors in the region, the weakening of the USA's and uh, collective West position, China's expansion uh, in trade and economic influence in the region has given rise to completely different political realities where the new geopolitical geopolitics of the region of superpowers, the US, China, and Russia parallel competition, uh, competition processes. And briefly speaking about the China's policy towards Georgia and Azerbaijan, it should be noted that China is today in the top 10 largest uh, export partners of Georgia. China also pays great attention to Azerbaijan. It accounts uh, for more than 40% of China's uh, trade turnover in the region. In other words, it is noticeable that the Chinese side has initially given a comprehensive nature and context to its policy in South Caucasus, cooperating and working with all the forces in the region. The Chinese side, however, is bringing its formulated political and economic goals to the region. In order to implement all this, it's uh, impossible to find out and understand the perceptions of the countries in, in the region about the Chinese side. Whether each of the countries in the region is significantly dependent on uh, this or that geopolitical center, the increase of the Chinese factor, especially the prospect of developing a new uh, Iran-China axis, may create opportunities for geopolitical alternatives for the countries of the region. In this regard, the reinterpretation of the foreign policy goals, interests, and problems for the Armenian side is very significant, significant, important, and binding, especially taking account the fact that the deepening of multilateral relations with the China and the Iran axis may become a geopolitical alternative for Armenia. Which Why in case of, yes, uh, I'm going to sum up. Uh, and I want to uh, speak about the uh, uh, short about Armenian Chinese relations, which are paramount important for us. And the development of Armenian Chinese relations uh, must be developed not only bilaterally, but also on multilateral platforms and levels. We must direct our work in this direction by increasing our place, role, and significance within the framework of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It should be noted that there is a lot of work to be done in this direction. Armenia, like Azerbaijan and Turkey, have the status of perfect country in the organization. Pakistan can battle this issue, but in case of correct, organized, and calculated work with Russia, Iran, as well as India, it's possible to neutralize the risk by eliminating the existing and possible obstacles. Fully engaging in the work of the organization, gaining the benefits of that work. So, summarizing the above, above mentioned, we can say that the framework of China's South Caucasus relations and cooperation is a system that is constantly in, uh, changing and reorganizing a reality that is constantly influenced by regional and extra regional developments and changes, which is currently registering a new and unique historical stage of this development. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. Uh, now we are over with all presentations. 
and it's a good time. It's my my favorite part of all conferences when we take questions and see how panelists speakers try to reply these these questions which uh, come from their areas of interest. If we have questions from the audience online, I can take them. Otherwise, I will use my small power of the moderator to to ask my questions that I, I, I try to have from your speeches and presentations regarding China, its relation with the South Caucasus, with the Central Asian countries. If you don't have questions from the audience, online and offline, then let me um, start my questions. Then let's um, ask my question to, to the first speaker. Uh, Dr. Dimitriva, are you here? Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Dr. Dimitriva, you, uh, you talked about China's involvement in Central Asia. And in your paper, did you talk about the regional approach and also that the countries of the Central Asia have different foreign policies and basically they are different countries with different views? And my question would be, how do you see Chinese involvement in that region? Will it contribute to regional cooperation and integration or vice versa? It will atomize them even more. Thank you. Thank you for your question. From my point of view, China used to cooperate in bilateral relations. They are not going to build a multilateral structure. Uh, we can say about the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but uh, it was uh, created to manage with border issues. And after China tries to develop bilateral uh, relations, but when you say in multilateral approach, um, China do not like to use this approach. Okay, thank you. And do we have Dr. Danelia online or is she still offline? Thank you, uh, Dr. Dimitriva. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your quick answer. And uh, let me ask a question to Dr. Sudip Singh. Okay, I have, I yeah. have a question. Yeah. Uh, okay. My question is just uh, to ask uh, Mr. Tokobayang, and uh, I'm very uh, interested in your sharing about the Chinese and Caucasus, but I think uh, you, mm, I, I want to know that uh, your your ideas about uh, the uh, the influence uh, the uh, US and Russia in the US South Caucasus, especially after uh, the, the Nagorno Karabakh war. What do you think the future relations uh, between the U.S. and Russia? Uh, what, 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 where is there uh, more competitive in this uh, region? What well, I want to know. I want to know your idea about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the important and interesting question. Uh, in my article in, uh, on which I'm now working, uh, I spent uh, a lot of uh, great information about uh, the current situation in South, South Caucasus after the second uh, Karabakh War, and I can uh, um, I can cite from my article uh, if you don't mind. And um, about uh, the Arts of War, uh, and after the Arts of War, uh, the, uh, first of all, taking into account Armenia's dependence on Russia from the security point of view, which reached enormous proportions, especially after the second Arts of War, or Karabakh War, Armenia should try to act in a geopolitical position that will not pose threats and challenges to the country's vital security interests. Therefore, it is assumed and predictable that a certain integration of Armenia into Chinese rather than Western projects may be even more uh, acceptable for the Russian side and uh, for also uh, Chinese side, taking into account not only the future prospects for Russia-Armenian, but also Armenian-Chinese relations and their potential assessment. So uh, I think that uh, 
uh, in current situation, in current status quo, it's important uh, for not our country, but uh, for also uh, other uh, countries in the region to uh, save uh, its uh, all uh, its all uh, components of national security and also the security environment. Also, thank you so much for important question. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Dr. Chao, for asking this question because you already asked a question to Maria. I will have my question to Maria since we also have some technical issues with other speakers. Maria, you talk about Armenia and China's relations. And uh, for Armenia, it will be very important to have strategic partnership with China, although we don't have this yet. But hopefully, the Armenian government and the policymakers will turn a better better, let's say, I to, to China, uh, not only having some uh, humanitarian projects, but also investments and other things, that other initiatives that are important for any country to develop, and also to provide something to that country, not only to get it, but to provide. So how do you think, how Armenia can be interesting for, for China and what Armenia can offer to China? Thank you, Mr. Malikian, for an uh, interesting question. Uh, Armenia is a milestone and as a uh, center of all civilization uh, can send and also can offer some uh, cultural, uh, I think, uh, soft power uh, tools and soft power methods to uh, Chinese side. Uh, I think that Armenia can offer its uh, cultural investigations, cultural uh, researches, or not uh, also not only cultural but also scientific. We have, um, uh, uh, we have some advanced uh, and uh, some uh, progress in uh, R and D uh, research uh, modes, and I think that Armenia can offer this also. Thank you, Maria. Although I would like to hear a lot, a little bit more about more, let's say, economic. Uh, commercial trade issues rather than just the cultural, it's okay. I mean, but we have to have products in all the fields and because of China is also a very, very extremely interesting cultural country with a huge, uh, like long years of civilization. So Armenia also can take a lot from China. But yeah, let's turn our, 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 uh, my questions to, to, to Dr. Chao. Because we, I don't see uh, others to be connected. And uh, Dr. Chow, you have a very interesting approach in trying to see how the regime of governance and stability domestically are interconnected. So how do you see from China, it's too far from Armenia and, and Georgia and Azerbaijan, uh, all, all those changes, transformations that we are going through since the independence in 1991, or since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, do you see that those uh, transformations, those transitions, are, let's say, use it that word, is not very scientific word, but uh, is it normal? Is it, I mean, to how many times those republics need to change the, the system of governance to achieve the most effective one? Thank you for your question. It's a very great, uh, fantastic question because uh, uh, you know that uh, 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 even uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Chinese government has uh, uh, rethink about uh, the regime and uh, think uh, how to keep the, the regime stable and uh, how to let the people, uh, uh, how to meet, meet the, the people's uh, demand. So now you know that after after several uh, people's congress meetings that uh, we have uh, we have uh, council consul consolidated the regime by the uh, uh, using the communist party. You know the communist party is very uh, strong and great in the China, and uh, uh, with the, the communist parties is just the the king and the the source of the political stability. And uh, uh, is in Chinese uh, uh, political theory that uh, uh, without communist parties, the, the, the regime cannot sustain its stability. And without communist party, uh, 
and we will face more challenges and difficulties from the outer external environment. So uh, now that you know that after Xi Jinping uh, uh, can uh, take control of the regime, that uh, we have we have seen uh, a new uh, stage, and we also limited. Uh, we, we in in political we are the uh, limited. We we not uh, uh, take uh, more power from the people, and uh, we uh, set up a goal that we uh, uh, get a more. Uh, energy and efforts to set up a new party, a great party and uh, uh, a big party. Uh, this is a party is uh, just the uh, stand for the people's interest and uh, uh, serve for the people's interest. So it's kind of the, uh, the, the, the Chinese regime come out of the regime change and uh, came to the great step one. <laughs> That's my answer. Maybe I, I don't know, can I answer your question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Chow. Dr. Singh, I, I have read your paper about Indian perception. I mean, the abstract of your paper, and you'd like to have more elaborations and to have the, the, the full version of that. When you speak about the, the Taliban, about uh, border issues, so my question is about India's security strategy and border management for upcoming years in relation with uh, with Central Asia and China. How do you see those those issues? <clears throat> we have a very uh, good relationship with uh, Central Asian Republic since their inception. And uh, we have uh, provided them all adequate uh, support, whatever they needed. But uh, uh, as far as uh, China is concerned, we have a turbulent relationship. We have cooperation, but we have a conflict also. And our border has uh, is still undecided in the midst of Corona. Last year, China intruded uh, in our Ladakh sector and our forces fought a bloody war after 50 years. So we have a trust deficit and those trust deficit uh, will be there for decades because uh, we can't clap from one hand and Chinese are not cooperating and showing their arrogance. So this is a kind of uh, typical uh, balance of power conflict in Asia because Chinese wants to dominate Asia as a unipolar power, but as a multipolar power at the globe. India and like-minded countries are thinking otherwise and they we says to have a multiple Asia, and that is a major conflict between India and China's Asian perspective. And that is also a big hindrance into the realization of an Asian century, which is supposed to be here by the second we, uh, decade of the 21st century, but it is not. But for Central Asia, we have a very good uh, uh, sustainable relationship. But yes, we have not so much advanced in terms of our trade, in terms of our connectivity in comparison with China, but we are trying our level best to cope up at the earliest. Thank you very much, Dr. And I still try to get connected with our Georgian colleague in Tbilisi, but seems that she's already offline, which allows me to uh, summarize this, this uh, very, very interesting panel. And we could talk endlessly about uh, Central Asia, about South Caucasus in relation with China, a uh, country which is some consider as a rising power, some consider as a threat, some consider as a partner. So uh, I just take advantage of, 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 this, uh, of this event to suggest, to invite all our speakers to be more involved in those researches and especially uh, regarding Armenia and to come to Armenia, to visit Armenia, to have a cooperation uh, between universities, research centers. So I, I, I'm uh, again thankful to all, all participants or our panelists. I know it's late in some countries, it's a bit late also in Armenia. So have a good, good evening, nice evening. And uh, we are always in touch, and I'm thankful to the organizers for this very important opportunity and to all speakers again. Thank you very much, and see you soon.